I have clipped out here just the sections of the lecture that pertain to place names and places that would concern watermen and surfers. Okay, now here's, here's where the Mo'olelo come in. Part of Nanakuli Beach, Nanakuli, they call that one. <laughs> um, Part of Nanakuli Beach Park is, a, is called Zablon Beach. And the Zablons were three brothers who came from Guam. And they settled out in, they settled out in the area, um, right here next to the beach. And people, the homesteaders out there started telling their kids, if you guys are gonna go swimming, go swim down in Zablon Beach, you know, down by where the Zablons live. Anyway, between, between the 1920s when Zablon Beach was fir first introduced out there, that name has now evolved into Subland. S-U-B-L-A-N-D. Has anybody heard that? Subland. Okay. I have a retired fireman out in Nanakuli who told me that he's been hearing that from the young kids. Yes, the Mo'olelo behind the name Zablon was lost over the years and now it's, I guess it's, some of the kids are calling it Subland. Okay, so this is how names change, uh, not only Hawaiian names, but English names. And here's another one in Nanakuli Beach Park too. This is Nanakuli, in Hawaii. <laughs> this is the Nanakuli train depot. Ian, where are you? Back there. Have you seen this photo before? Yes. Have you? Okay. You can see the train coming down the tracks just off to the right there. So anyway, this depot, this train depot, was right at the intersection of Farrington Highway and Haleakala, which are, which are the two streets out there now. So the beach across the street, everybody called it Depot Beach. Right now, between, between the early, and the train stopped running in 1947. So the name Depot has evolved into Deep Holes. <laughs> and now the kids out there call the beach Deep Holes Beach. So, do things like that happen on the North Shore? And I just wanted to give you guys uh, a couple of examples. Have things like that happen on the North Shore where names are lost, where the names change? Yes, they have. Here's what led to place name changes and place names disappearing out on the North Shore, a little different than over on the, over on the Waianae side and on the Kuli side. What led to the loss and the changes out here were guardrails. You see the guardrail there to your right? Now that guardrail nicely comes right up to the bridge, but doesn't tie into it. But as the state, the Department of Transportation went around our island over the years, putting in these guardrails, a lot of times they tied the guardrails right into the bridges and covered over the years and covered over the place names. And as I've learned during my research, some of these names you don't find anywhere else except on the bridges. Now, this is Lani Akea over on the North Shore. So anyway, this is Laufulu, L-A-U-H-U-L-U. The guardrail is, is covering up the entire name except for the last two letters. So Laufulu, for everybody that drives by out there now, is lost. Mm -hmm. So this particular area, and Laufulu are the plains. They're the plains, uh, the pastures in the back of this bridge. So right now, this, this name is pretty much lost to that area, and you folks have probably heard its most recent name uh, given most often, which is Turtle, Turtle Beach. Beach. Exactly right. Okay, here's an example, 1940-something, we've lost the date on the bridge. This is, a, this is a bridge that's out near Mokalei Beach Park. This is going out right out by the Dillingham Airfield. The place name on this bridge, I happened to capture it oh, back in the 70s. It was Poli Poli, P-O-L-I, P-O-L-I. And the name was complete, when the guardrail went in on this bridge, the name was completely covered up. The surfers, you can see that there's waves offshore there. The surfers call this spot Polis. They just take one name and add an S to it. They call it Polis, okay? Um, I asked one of the guys over here at Polis, I said, where did that name come from? And he says, oh, take a look down the road. You see all those telephone poles? <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway, that's just kind of a general overview of place names, how I go about my work, doing my interviews, checking out maps. And what I do as much as possible is I try to cross-check. 
I try to, I try to cross check all the information that I get. That's not always possible, especially from Native Hawaiian informants. Sometimes they may be the only ones at this point in time that know that name. And sometimes you just gotta go with the flow. If, if they're the only ones that knew that name and they gave it to you and it seems legitimate, go with it. Let's jump right into Holly Evo. So Holly Evo wasn't a place name until the Emersons got out there in 1832. They're Christian missionaries. The, the, uh, the missionaries are sending people like the Emersons out into these remote areas on all of the islands, and they're getting them to establish missions where they can spread the gospel and also to teach people English and you know everything else that goes with it, right? So one of the Emerson's children wrote a book called Pioneer Days in Hawaii, Oliver Emerson. And this is what he says for the name for Holly Eva. He tells us in the book that in 1865, the Gulicks moved out to Holly Eva or to the area. And they, they established, and the Emerson's are living on Honolulu on Street. The Gulicks build a house across the street and they build a school and they call it the Wailua Female Seminary. The Hawaiians in the neighborhood though, they call it Holly Eva, House of the Eva Bird, okay? That's an Eva, that's an Eva in flight. These birds have a wingspan of about seven feet. They're a very beautiful, graceful bird and they like to fly high. So Eva, besides being the name of the bird, Eva is also a, po a poetic name for a beautiful person in the Hawaiian language. Pole? Yes? Okay. So Hale Eva, Hale Eva to the native Hawaiians out there, doesn't mean house of the Eva bird. They're using the name poetically for the girls, the girls in the school. And to them, the Eva is representing all of these beautiful young ladies who are, who are in the female seminary. Okay. Yeah, just yes. The Eva Anne Maka is the Eva that entrances the eye. <laughs> nice. Say again. The Eva Anne Maka. And sometimes the Eva Anne Maka says it, say so on. But the hypnotizing kind of thing. Very good. <laughs> good house, I guess. <laughs> So anyway, going back to that drawing that you folks just saw, the seminary and the Gulick home, those three-story buildings that we were looking at, that's Haleiwa, and that, that name was established in 1865. So in my mind, that's the Mo'olelo, that's the beginning of the Mo'olelo of the place named Haleiwa. Okay, now the school runs, the Gulicks run the school up until about 1870, and then a new principal comes in, uh, her name is Mary Green, and she runs it up until about the 18, early 1880s, about 1882, and then the school closes. Now the name though, the name Holly Eva doesn't die, it gets perpetuated where? In the hotel, exactly right. So 1899, the railroad has already come around Cayenne Point, Dillingham's already brought it around, and the target on the North Shore is the Haleiwa Hotel, right there on the Anahulu River. And so the name is reintroduced, but they define it as beautiful home. They leave off beautiful person. They don't say home of the beautiful people. They just say beautiful home. They take the beautiful part. And that's usually how it's translated. You hear that in the songs. Haleiwa, beautiful home, right? Okay, very good. So the name is perpetuated, and as the town grows up around the hotel, eventually the people in the community decide that that's the name that they want for their town, and they adopt that name, and it becomes Haleiwa. Now the beach park, real quick, uh, the beach park that's now Haleiwa Beach Park was originally called Waialua Beach Park. The people in Haleiwa did the same thing that the folks over in Naunapului did, they petitioned the mayor. They petitioned the mayor to change the name to Haleiwa Beach Park. He agreed, and that's been the name ever since. 
So to me, that kind of frames that the model of Hollywood. Does that sound good to all of you? All right, sounds good to me too. <laughs> now we're going to move on to another place name. This is Anahulu Stream, and this is the famous, the iconic bridge um, that's in Haleiwa. You know, the, the double arches, the rainbow bridge, as some people call it. So Anahulu Stream Bridge, okay. So this is a source of place names. Built by the city and county of Honolulu, 1921. So that's really an old bridge. I mean, that goes right back to the, the early days, the beginnings of our highways. Now, the bypass road, the Joseph Leong Highway that goes, bypasses the town of Haleiwa, this is the sign there. It says, Anahulu, uh, Anahulu Uka, in other words, inland or upland uh, Anahulu, river bridge. Now, what's the difference between this sign and the one that, the, that you just saw? This one calls Anahulu a river. The other one calls it what? So what is it? If you're going to write a book, if you're me and you're writing and you're researching, are you going to call it Anahulu Stream or Anahulu River? It's there. It's there on both. It's there. Which are you going to pick? Pardon? That's what I did. I went with Stream with the original. I figured the guys in 1921 probably probably knew what they were talking about. And you see where the guardrails tied in? At least they didn't tie it into the place in the on this one. You're looking at Haleiwa Beach Park right in the front. That's Kalili Surf Center um, right near the water. And Kayaka Bay and Kayaka Park are off there to your right. Do you all see that deep hole, that deep blue hole? Does anybody know what that is? It's called the Haleiwa Trench, the Haleiwa Trench. And from that super shell reef, it drops straight down. It drops straight down to 90 feet. And scuba divers love it because you don't need a boat to do a deep dive. You can just walk right off the beach, cross the reef, and drop off and you're 90 feet down. If you go on some of the dive sites, the dive shops that advertise Haleiwa Trench dives, they say that that trench was dredged in World War II to hide submarines. Does that make sense to anybody? No. Does it make sense to me? No, Petey? No. <laughs> That's all we need. That's all we need. Anyway, if you go online, Bill, if you go online or somebody does for you, if you go online, that's the Mo'olelo that's, that's being promoted now for the Haleiwa Trench. Okay, I wanted to put in a plug for the North Shore Chamber of Commerce. The North Shore Chamber of Commerce is, uh, this is their office, and they give out free brochures that have all of the historic sites in Haleiwa mapped out for you. They give these are just a couple of slides that show the horse culture that was out on the North Shore during the 1800s. There weren't cars, obviously, and trucks didn't show up until when? The early 1900s. That's when our highways started being built. So prior to that, everybody was walking a lot or they were riding horses. This particular photo of all of these Paniolo was taken at Lelihua Ranch, um, which is up in the Waiwa area, but it would have been the same on the North Shore. Okay, the rest of these photos um, came from the Haleiwa area. And what are they doing here? Branding. Branding, exactly right. So it's like the Wild West in Haleiwa right here. So this is a, a blacksmith. And Barb, this is right in Haleiwa town. Yeah, Nina is, yeah. Right in, Oh, Dot, is, it, is this near you? Is that, it near your home? That's my grandfather's. This is your grandfather's? Uh, <laughs> blacksmith shop. Okay. So he, he shooed horses, he repaired wagons, he made wagons, and this is right out there um, in Haleiwa. Now, just so you all know, um, do you all know Surf and Sea? The surf shop out there? That was Dot's home. Wow. Oh. So if I, if I have this right, your family, your family lived in the upstairs and your family store was downstairs, is that correct? Yes, it's a busy. Okay. And that original building is still there, that was her family home. 
So did you know anything about the mo'o back there in the ponds? Did you guys ever hear, little, hear those stories? Yes, you said, yeah. Okay, very good. Very good. And you can see that there's a wagon being built um, at the top of that rim. These are uh, Chinese farmers planting rice. As many of you historians know, a lot of the, the lo'i, the taro patches, were converted to rice paddies. And this happened out on the North Shore as well in Hawaii. And water buffalo were used in the rice paddies to plow. Another early 1900s uh, shot in Hawaii. And here's a couple of mules, again, prior to cars and trucks. Mules used for packing, plowing, whatever else. Okay, uh, right now we're moving out back to Kaina Point. Okay, I just wanted to remark quickly about the photograph because it's very unique. Uh, it happens very, very rarely that you have all the conditions for this photo photograph to be possible. No rain for two weeks, no surf at all, so the bottom's not stirred up. And uh, early in the morning, so there's no glare on the water. So you have to really get up early and catch the day just right. And the water is probably 100 feet deep out there at the top of the picture. You can see right through it. Usually it just looks choppy and brown or choppy and green, you know. It, you don't see this at all. And the, the cluster of buildings? Oh, uh, Camp Erdman. Very good. <laughs> so anyway, Camp Erdman, of course, is, is one of the landmarks um, out at the Kaina Point end of the uh, North Shore. And it was built in 1932 to honor Harold Erdman, who actually died in a polo accident in Waikiki in Kapilani Park. And the camp and the land were provided by his mother who happened to be a Dillingham. She was the sister of Walter Dillingham. And they, they allowed the YMCA to utilize the, the land and to build a camp out there to memorialize their son. Okay, here's another shot of Kaena Point. And there's two Wahi Pana out here, two famous places. One of them uh, we mentioned from the Emerson map, which was Pohaku Kauai. And there's a legendary story that the stone was actually thrown by a legendary figure on Kauai and it landed right here on the point. I have no idea which stone it is. Um, it's never been pointed out to me, but it's one of them out there. The other Wahipana that's out here is called, was called White Rock um, by, in English, but it was actually Alena, Alena Kauhane, a leaping place of the souls. So, Hawaiians believe that after you passed away, that your spirit would go to one of these lena, one of these lena kaohanes, uh, one of these leaping places, and then from there you would go off to the afterlife. And the spot was marked, um, I don't know if you guys can really see it. It doesn't look very big from the aerial photo, but that's actually a really good size uh, white limestone rock. And that was the leaping place right there. Pretty different view of Kaino Point, huh? I, I always wondered, how did, the, how did the train, how did the ORNL make this turn? How did, they, how did they set it up and get the train around this point? Anyway, they, obviously they did it on, on one of those roads. How's that for a beautiful picture? Huh? This is Pupukea Beach Park. Okay, so those of you that are familiar with the area of Pupukea Beach Park, the park starts there and it goes to that point that's right in the middle of the, of the of photo. Now, that, that little cluster of reef that you see there offshore of the sand beach, um, what's that called? Three tables, exactly right. So those reefs there, when you're standing on the beach and you're looking at them, they actually look like they're three sections. So those are the tables. Those are the three tables of the name there. So that's the mo'olelo for behind the place name, three tables. Now, you can see right at the end of the little beach there, there's some white water. That's a little surf spot, and it's called rubber duckies. <laughs> 
Have any of you heard of that name? Remember Yankees? Okay, what's the model for the name? During calm days like this, you know, like during the summer months, this is a family beach. And the moms and dads bring their little kids and all their playthings out to the beach, including rubber duckies. So the, kid, the kids fool around on the beach, the older kids go and catch a few waves out there. Rubber duckies surf spot. Okay, the big reef, the big reef that's there, Sunset Beach Fire Station is right behind it. That was called Kapo, which actually is for Kapo. And that's the, it's, it, may, it means the, the roar of the sea, something along those lines. So if you look up K-A-P-O-O in Pukui and Albert, the Hawaiian Dictionary, um, you'll find that definition. The point in the far on the other side there is what's called Kulalua, Kulalua. And those particular Hawaiian names I got from uh, one of the Hawaiian families on the North Shore, the Hokalas, the Hokala family. And that's what, that's what um, Kapo'o looks like right there, straight down on it. And the little cove to the right is Shark's Cove. You all recognize that name, I'm sure. Are there sharks there? No. No more than anywhere else. <laughs> the name came from the divers. All of the scuba divers that go diving in that little cove, they, they just tagged it with that name way back when, and that's what it's been ever since. This is, a, this is one of the classic photos of Waimea Bay. This shows the bridge that the, uh, the train ran across, and you can see a man that's standing in there just for depth perception. Now, one of the interesting things that I ran across uh, while doing research in the Hawaiian language newspapers was an interesting statistic, and it was two train fatalities. And they happened on the North Shore. One of them was at Puiki, which is over on the Mokuleia side. A woman tried to drive her car uh, and beat the train, and she didn't beat it, and the train cleaned her car off. So anyway, she died. And the other one was actually back in Kahuku. Uh, the, train, the train was um, heading down the tracks, and apparently there was a Hawaiian walk, uh, walking either on or right next to the tracks who was deaf. Oh. And he didn't hear the train coming, and the engineer didn't see him. The engineer hit him and killed him. But if you think about that, I mean, train fatalities, right? That's not a statistic that you would imagine for the Hawaiian Islands. And we've got two of them right out there on the North Shore. Okay, we're going to finish off here at Waimea Bay. Waimea, of course, is one of the most famous uh, bays on the island for surfing, big wave riding. Anybody recognize these two surfers? How about the guy on the right? Who, who would you guess? Eddie Aikala. That's Eddie. That's Eddie Aikala. This photo was taken in the 1970s, and you know the guy on the left. You just don't know him looking that young. That's Fred Hemmings. <laughs> So this is early 1970s, and Fred calls this the Freddy Eddie picture. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, both of them riding big waves, and of course, Eddie went on to be the first lifeguard at uh, Waimea Bay, and that was back in the early 1970s. So Waimea is famous for a lot of things. It's famous for its big wave surfing. It's got a lot of history. There are a lot of wahipana there. This is another aerial shot from Brian. Um, one of the wahipana in the area is up to your right there. Anybody recognize what that is? That's Pua Mahuka Heiau, exactly right. And that was apparently one of the most important heiau on this island. And I guess the, 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 the stories say that fires that were lit there could be seen across the channel in Kauai. Have you guys ever heard that? Yeah. I wanted to focus on something that Waimea was famous for in the 1800s that really hasn't come up on too many people's radar screens, and that was river surfing. Yeah. Yes. Uh, look at the river. Look at the river right now. The river is backed up into a perfect position to start the river running and to river surf. And hey, hey, Pu'iwai, river surfing. I was not only surprised when I was doing my research to find out that Native Hawaiians river surfed at Waimea Bay, but they also river surfed on three other islands. Hawaii Island, the Big Island, on Maui, and on Kauai, the places that had 
rivers, strong rivers that were running into the ocean. And when I talk about river surfing now, we're talking about surfing like that. We're not talking about just throwing your, your rubber mat into the river and cruising into the ocean. We're talking about actually riding a stationary wave that's forming as the river flows into the ocean. So this guy is not on an open ocean wave. He's actually riding a stationary wave in the river. That's why the water's a little brown. <coughs> So we saw, we saw the beginnings of a river surfing session, right? We saw the aerial, the water was backed up right to the edge of the beach. What are these guys doing? Opening it up. They're opening it up, exactly right. So as soon as, as soon as the river fills up, all of the river surfers, they see, you know, they got it. They all go get their shovels and they come down and start digging. And what they're going to do is they're going to dig a little channel just to get the river started and then they're just going to let it run, let it run right into the bay. So this is, this is looking upstream, this is looking upstream at the bay, so this guy that's standing on his bodyboard is actually riding upstream, not into the ocean. Okay? And you can see that the channel is just starting to open up, the river's just starting to run. Now look where the sand is. Look where the sand is. So this guy's between the two banks of sand as the river is running. And he's just cranking this radical turn uh, right in front of the sand bank. So how do you do it? All you do is when the river runs, the stationary waves form. You just stand on the side with your bodyboard, your boogie board. And as soon as you see that wave form, you just dive right into it. The rides only last for maybe about a minute at the longest. They're very short. And then after the wave dies out, you just wash out into the ocean. You can see everybody out there. And you can see they're in the open ocean, right? They've just washed out. They'll swim back in and do it again. Is it the water kind of level? The water is very level. Yeah, so you got to realize when the river is running right now, every, everything that's upstream, you know, whether it's dead animals or leptospirosis or whatever it is, you know, the tree branches, tree trunks, I mean, it's all coming down river, it's coming at you. So anyway, as far as the dangers go, Pukia, um, the lifeguards, when the river runs and the river surfing's going on, the lifeguards actually stand up there on the riverbank and make sure nobody gets pulled under or hit or, you know, injured. Nanette's making a really good point. There is a danger besides everything coming downstream that might hit you. There is a hydraulic action that will pull you down and hold you down. And the lifeguards watch for that too. And it's like being under a waterfall. You know, to, you can't swim up to get away. You have to go down. You gotta go down and swim out. And the lifeguards watch for that. If somebody disappears underwater for too long, they know that the guy's being held under. Pretty spectacular picture, isn't it? So anyway, this is something that I just wanted to call to your attention. Like I said, Waimea Bay and the North Shore are famous for a lot of things, but river surfing was huge for Native Hawaiians, and it's still huge today. Waimea is considered one of the best river surfing spots in the entire world. And if you go online and look up river surfing, people do it now, they, they do it now all over the world. So anyway, everyone, that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, if any of you have any questions 